Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Beyond Train Podcast. I'm your host, Liam Dalton. Today, we're joined by Mr. Jamie Andrews once again. We had an amazing presentation from him last time. Um, Obviously, this man is doing some phenomenal work. Um, You should definitely go listen to the last episode if you did not listen to it. Uh, Got quite a few hits. I think most of the the listeners got to it. Um, This is a huge buzz in the the train field. So um, I'm very fortunate to be able to chat with this gentleman again. Uh, I'm really excited to sort of dig into his insights and thoughts beyond sort of the project that he's doing with the falsification of the cell culture methodology. Um, it just kind of really excited to, to learn more about him and um, learn more about, you know, how he approaches science in general, you know, and, and his thoughts on that. So, uh, Mr. Andrews, thank you so much for coming back again today. Hi, Liv. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be uh, back on and uh, this time, you know, not not uh, sweating about uh, doing the PowerPoint presentation and, uh, you know, everything like that, a bit a bit more free flowing. So, um, you know, and it's nice to discuss the kind of, uh, uh, you know, background behind um, behind all of this, you know, the core, the core principles of, um, you know, well, what I believe science is and, um, you know, because I think we 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 need to start on, on solid ground. You know, if we're going to try and start something new, we're going to try and, um, uh, you know, delve into different areas. I think that we all need to start, you know, in roughly the same area. I couldn't agree more. So let's begin with with that. That sounds amazing place to start. What are your take on the core principles of science? Where do we begin? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've always been one for. There's, there's, there's lots of ologies in in science, aren't there? You know, it's. Uh, I've, I've always found science um, far too kind of the- theory heavy. You know, when when you look at um, lots lots of areas of science, it's all theoretical science. It's all uh, you know words and and. Um, uh, explanations uh, uh, based w- without experimentation. I, I'm I'm kind of very much into um, uh, trial and errorology. You know, just roll up your sleeves and give it a go and experiment and 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 experiment in real life. Um, uh, and and just having an observe you know an observable effect on what what happens with that you know i think it's all very well and good kind of writing in theory and ba- basing things on you know the the scientific method which you know i agree with in in most parts um uh there is still a um <clears throat> you know a kind of tying in between philosophy and practical science and you know that area of philosophy when it comes to science and epistemology is you know um subjective it is subjective however much you go into it and so um i like to rely as a core principle just on kind of the physical world in front of me the 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 tangible um the uh uh, uh, the movable, the, the, the quantifiable. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, we can go further into it, you know, with, with more questions, but I, I can't, I can't hear your mic. Sorry, my bad. There we go. Um, you know what I'm seeing, like what I'm hearing here is kind of a, a distinguish between the pure science and sort of applied science in a way you know are yeah. we focusing too much on on the pure sciences in your opinion yeah that said i mean you know i i i like to i like to build things and, and pull things apart you know there, there's there's kind of a thing with we you know between engineers and you know kind of theoretical scientists you know it's it's kind of um you know things like uh, you know fixing a car doesn't doesn't phase me i just undo it you know the first the first few i i made a lot of mistakes right (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. the car doesn't work i i wouldn't take it into a garage i would just get out the manual and have a look and pull it apart and see what happens you know and you make a lot of mistakes doing that 
Um, but, you know, especially in the world that we live in today, I think that, um, you know, with more and more information, when you can pick up that information, it, it becomes easier and easier to not rely on other people to do it. And I think that is, that to me is more like a core principle of, of what science should be, is that, you know, you're, you're just doing things that are, that are tangible. You see, most of theoretical science, all of theoretical science, I would say, is just political propaganda. It's just, you know, some kind of segueing into, um, you know, kind of coded speak for things that are controlling in nature. So, you know, they want you to put a mask on and there's 10,000, you know, mask studies where, you know, they just obfuscate the truth and, you know, use all these different, you know, theories that aren't, aren't grounded in any sort of practical application. And all of a sudden they're creating practical application for something that has no grounding. So it's kind of, you know, working back in theoretical science where they hold this pill up or they hold a mask up or they hold, um, you know, anything, a space rocket or, you know, and, and say, this is the practical ap application. It's all it's all rooted in theoret theory. You know, it's not the other way around. It's not you know, we've worn masks all these times, or we've had all of these pills, and everybody's getting better, or you know, cancer is getting you know less and less because of these things. It's always the other way around, and so I think you know, starting with that kind of applied applied science rather than theoretical science is quite um uh quite a big one for me yeah you're just getting in getting your hands dirty and kind of putting it to the test you know and it seems like nowadays science as an empirical endeavor seems to take on a deductive way of reasoning you know we have our theories which seem to be based on up a whole bunch of nothing, even though we consider ourselves to be empirical in our endeavor. Um, but like this idea of um, masks being effective, like you're saying, um, you know, we have this germ theory, we're working backwards. Well, if germs are spread, can like in <laughs> contagion through germs is a real phenomenon, then covering your mouth, you know, is going to be a viable way to because, you know, when you look at the empirical literature on the effectiveness of masks, you see, you know, they don't have the results once again, if they actually try to back it up with any sort of experiment. Well, that, um, that, that's the thing. I mean, you know, it, it kind of works the other way around um, and, until you kind of benchmark it. Like, like you say, with, with masks, you know, it's predicated on the fact that, you know, people didn't wear masks all the time, um, you know. You only have to go to kind of Southeast Asia and, and look at how how many people. I mean, they basically wear them for pollution a lot of the time, you know. And there's some kind of cultural uh, thing, you know. But other than that, previously, you know, nobody had had worn these things, and so there is no kind of, you know, you can see no cause and effect with it, you know. One of the interesting things is, um, you know, I've looked quite deeply into. Um, uh, antigen tests and uh you know they say that um uh you know pregnancy tests are um done with antigens they 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 have an um an antibody in them or something which um you know measures a certain amount of uh this uh hormone or whatever that 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 suggests that you're pregnant now um, that's all very well and good. And, and people would say and point at that and go, see, look, that's applied science. That's what's happening because, uh, you know, it, it's pretty accurate. You know, they, they say it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, 90% accurate or something like that. Right. You know, but what they're actually doing is kind of skewing the data. They're, they're skewing the data because it's not used across the board. It's only used by females. And females that have, you know, to put it bluntly, seen some action and so believe that they would be 
pregnant. And so right there, you have the data that's skewed. So it's predicated on something, you know, this, this stick, uh, this, this test is predicated on something being applied science. But actually, when you pull it apart, it's, it's not so clear. Because the other thing to note is, is that they actually found out that some men we're using these sticks, you know, you can imagine that you can imagine the setup, a man, you know, at a party drunk or whatever, pees on one. And lo and behold, some of these men were being tested positive for being pregnant. You know, I'm, I'm not part of that, you know, well, it's uh, 2024, not, not, go, not going maybe. into the poli- politics of, you know, <laughs> transgenderism and all that shit. But, um, you know, the, uh, they they had to scramble, you know, and say that oh oh, you know, when we say that there's these specific antibodies, yeah, that are in these things that are measuring pregnancy, oh, you know, actually it's a sign that males have got testicular cancer, and so, you know, uh, because there's some some kind of hormone in testicular, you know, they just make it they just make it up from then on in. You've got to go on to, if you if you're a man and you use this test which tells you you're either pregnant or you've got testicular cancer, then you should go and get yourself tested. And so, you know, we're already in. When when you apply the science, the theoretical science, when you actually start to benchmark test it in real life, all of a sudden they're having to come up with these theories. They're having to come up with this inventive reasoning to explain why it doesn't work in, a, in applied science rather than, uh, you know, just admitting to start off with that, uh it's it's probably not the antibodies in them. It, you know, I I would say it's it's a, a Biarritz test for protein. It's as simple as that. That when you look at all of the constituent parts of a pregnancy test, it's um, it's it's uh, a, a sulfate group, copper, copper sulfate group, and uh, the Biarritz test uh, is that in a in a solution, and it goes purple in the um, presence of a protein. And so I I think that. Uh, females and obviously males who are suffering, and I would say, I would extend that to um, you know people who are heavily detoxing have protein or raised levels of protein in their urine, and it's a, it's a basic you know high school level um, pro- protein test. And uh, you know if if you think that you're pregnant and you've got a lot of protein coming out then because you've got another person developing inside of you and you know so on and so forth and you're clearing out that waste material um and also starting to generate more blood and um you know to thicken up the lining of the womb then you know that that's how it works but um you know we're kind of slowly unstitching this (laughs) theoretical science which has built up things that vaguely work in the real world, but don't actually function properly as they should do, you know? And I think that bringing things back and, and keeping it simple is, um, mm-hmm. and, and, and starting with applied science, um, sure. Can kind of unmuddy the waters a little bit moving forward. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's funny because, you know, like even with, to your point, you know, with, with pregnancy, like, well, if someone is pregnant, you know, they can test positive for HIV. You know, there are so many things that test positive for HIV, um, based on the serological interventions. Same with, uh, you see a big difference between the PCR test versus the antigen test during the, the COVID fiasco, right? With the PCR test for my observations across the board, PCR was generally random and it depend on the the cycles and and sort of the parameters of the implementation of PCR. Um, and when it comes to the antigen test, only people who were sick were testing positive. It wasn't random anymore. They were likely testing this protein content of the blood during you know, detox. And- yeah, I mean, here, here you're, you're um, saying all the things that, that, I, that I think um, that I'm observing too is, is that and I think most would observe is is that there is they they these things are measuring something. I think they're measuring something mm-hmm. in the sample um, because even though the data again is skewed because the people most likely to be um, 
uh, taking these tests are sick or exhibiting some sorts of symptoms now. I mean, obviously not in 2020, people were just doing them to see if they could get off work or get off school or uh, swabbing the cat and, uh, you know, um, just to see what happened. And I, I would, you know, I, I would encourage uh, all of these controls. I've just written a, a sub stack basically, you know, encouraging um, people to, uh, you know, get these things um, that, that in the UK, um uh, some kids actually found out that you could um, uh, make a false positive with these uh, rapid antigen tests by putting Coca-Cola on them because they wanted to bunk off school. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is people power, you know, um, in action is people um, uh, 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 doing this applied science and, and really benchmarking and benchmark testing with controls, um, something that couldn't possibly contain uh, you know, a virus, i.e. A, um, a sealed can of Coke, um, you know, that has been sterilized at some point um, uh, or numerous points in its manufacturing process. So it shouldn't, you know, contain a virus. Um, and it is being used to, you know, show that these things aren't specific. Now, um, in like you say, um, kind of unstitching these tests is a little bit harder what exactly are they measuring i've just bought uh 250 of these antigen tests to try myself so they'll be delivered pretty soon just to sit sit in my kitchen and and dip different things on you know i have some some ideas um you know uh and when it comes to the pcr again it's just uh you, we can see that 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 potentially again, despite there being some slightly skewed data, because it's not just everybody testing. You would get much better data if just everybody at one time um, did a PCR test rather than people showing symptoms. You you would start to get an idea of just how accurate it can tell you whether you whether you're sick or not. Um, These but without tests that, you know, aren't done. Yeah, like they they don't te- they don't use these tests across the board generally to determine specificity or you know sensitivity. They don't do it across the board. None of these tests are tested across the board in some no. sort of. It, it's just ridiculous. You cannot find a paper on it. You can't. No, there's no kind of standardized thing. You know, considering they managed to standardize lockdown and standardize you know uh, mandating. Um, you know, vaccines and vaccine passports and everything like that. There's, it's strange that there is no standardized, you know, accuracy test on these things. Um, mm. So, yeah, I've, I've just unearthed some or just I haven't just unearthed it, but I've just released publicly on the Substack stack um, about some um, PCR controls that we did. And it was um, it's kind of fascinating that uh, we found another area of um, the way that um, uh people can manipulate um, the outcomes of these things that is just to do with the machines themselves. Like most people know uh, because it's just publicly available information about, um, you know, CT values and things like that. Uh, You know, it's not a massive revelation really that as the machine gets less accurate with CT values, the results get less reliable. I mean, that, that it's just kind of common sense, right? It writes it on the back of, of, you know, every single manufacturer's label will, will tell you that, um, uh, the, the kind of more interesting thing to look at is when you get kind of deep into actually using these things. And this is, you know, going back to the kind of start, you know, just rolling up your sleeves and actually starting to push some buttons. You know, I've always said, you know, with uh, a few of the geneticists that I work with as part of this project, it's like, if, if I could get my hands on one of these PCR thermocyclers, I would I would do it in a week. You know, I, I would find out what's going on in a week because I would put... I, I would put jam sandwiches in there. I would put Marmite in there. I would put, you know, um, dog poo, whatever. Do you know what I mean? You just throw a thousand different things at it and just and just go tell, you know, tell me what it is. Do you know what I mean? Because because people just use them in this very standard and, and um, 
rigorous way and then look through the manuals and say oh this ct value says this and it's th- less accurate you know you get you get caught up in their science you get caught up in in their theories and i think that mm. um it's it's not a pointless endeavor but it's um it doesn't really move the needle particularly far and and one of the things that we found out very quickly through doing um, some controls based on PCR was is that there's a thing called baseline correction um, and baseline correction is to they say to to drown out the noise yeah so there's a certain amount of noise that you get in these things and baseline correction within a PCR is something that is done before amplification so before any of these um uh, uh, flashing lights, because that's all it is, is a biochemical um, supposed indication. Um, and we can get a little bit more onto that. But um, the baseline correction is to supposedly drown out the noise, um, but it can be set. It's a threshold. It's not a, it's not a cycle threshold, which is after amplification where you're kind of reading off of the graph. It's a threshold where the machine ignores everything below it it starts from from where it is and an internal calibration tool like that when set low can give you false positives and when set high can give you negatives whereas otherwise they would be readings this is a complete calibr you know manual calibration that you can choose to reject and change the ct value the the so so people think oh a ct value of 30 okay is an acceptable result okay and you see a lot of people in the movement you know just talking about these ct values but they don't understand that there is a baseline correction which means that that 30 figure just, you know, if we completely ignore everything else, that 30 figure is different depending on the baseline correction that you have. And that baseline correction could be 15 cycles in difference. So that's just off of the, the primers manual and the, the setup of the, the PCR thermocycler that I have. So that 30 could mean 15 or it could mean 45. Now, 45 is fail, and 15 is, you know, very, very, very strong positive. You w- it will be like a positive control. And so e- even within their own parameters of their own science, and you only find these things out when you actually start to kind of push the buttons. I mean, we found that out by happenstance. We found that out, actually, because the geneticist that I was working with did some dry runs, and uh, they didn't set up one of the channels uh, on the thermocycler because the primers that we were using um, had an extra channel on it, okay? And um, the baseline correction was set very low for one and very high for the other channel. And with the same sample, with the same nucleotide sequence, one channel was positive and one channel was negative. That shouldn't happen. So the machine was showing that this baseline correction was forcing a negative, or in this case, it was giving the positive that it was giving, and then forcing a negative. So that's how much manipulation in one, you know, one of these parameters can have over the entire thing. And that's completely, you know, that's like a knob on one of these things. It's just a, well, turn that up and it's negative, or turn that down and it's positive. You know, um, and it's these Jamie, things, this and, and, and so like, that you know that that came about by yeah. making a mistake. It was a mistake yeah. because we didn't set up the machine correctly because we didn't know oh, that the right. channel you know was was used for that, and the baseline correction just happened to be high on that on that channel, so it it, it gave a negative, and it it we muffed up. We got it. We got it wrong. But that's what applied science is. It's just going in there and going, okay, see what happens. Oh, it broke. Okay. Right. Well, why did it break? You know, and, and you learn a lot. Mm-hmm. This baseline, is this mentioned in the literature, in the methods section, when they talk about setting up a PCR? 
Um, depends depends what you read. If you read, you know, the very core manuals of of setting, and this is QPCR, obviously the um, re- reverse transcriptase um, quantitative PCR. It's uh, you know slightly different from from the the, the uh, gel electrophoresis. Um, you know, this is this is all uh, um, it's all flashing lights, as I like to call it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean that that is available. Uh, you know, I I'll be releasing a, a video of um, a very uh, uh, polite man explaining all of this. You know, and they explain it as if, oh, you know, it's fine. You're cutting out the noise, but when you actually realise the power of these things, you know, it 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 seems a lot more sinister. You know, they they always present it as like, oh, this is very useful because you know you can get good results from it. But when you actually kind of read between the lines, it's um, uh, yeah. This 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 information is available. It's a little you have to you have to know kind of what the implications are. If if probably if I just played people the video without that kind of introduction as to what it was, you might be none the wiser. Well, it's rhetoric too, right? And we get back to these stories spun around what's happening, right? So you could present this in two very different ways. You could, and try and pre- present it objectively as you can, which, you know, I, I think that we're trying to get at here, um, but you could see how it could be explained otherwise. Like, you know, if it were by, you know, a geneticist or a molecular biologist, you know, they could spin it in a way where it is, well, we're canceling out the noise. Well, what the yeah, hell is I mean, noise? Th- what does this, this is, mean? Like, you know, a, a lot to do with, um, y- you know, the last few years is is that you get a lot of people who are saying, and uh, you know, it's always the logical fallacy. What so they're all in on it? Are they? Every single every single geneticist is in on this master plan that they are faking having a virus, and just no, I I don't think that the world works like that. I don't think that, you know, everybody's in on it, and they're all in this secret club, and, you know, and they're all keeping it hush-hush, and, you know, when everybody's not listening, um, they all go, oh, thank God, now we can talk about the fact that we're frauding this stuff on purpose. I think that... 99.9999% 99.9999% of these people have absolutely no idea what they're doing. You know, they they just plug themselves in and go, this is the results that we expect. And if it doesn't happen the way that it happens, then, you know, I, I, I've got it wrong somewhere and I need to find out how to get those results. You know, I think we touched briefly in the first um in the first interview about, you know, working with a few seasoned geneticists and microbiologists and them just explaining that, you know, within, and it, it, it is scary that they know what the results should look like before they start the experiment. And they're just working using these knobs, these, you know, these parameters that they can turn up or down and go, oh, okay, now it looks like it should. You know, really, if you actually put it into perspective, what they're doing is, is, I mean, it's fraud, really, you know, but they don't see it that way. They don't see it that way because they just know what it's meant to look like. And they don't try and put hamburgers into it or cat poo or, you know, they, you know, they don't ever experiment. They don't experiment themselves. You know, there, there are a very, 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 very tiny minority of people. And that's the reason why I didn't go into science is because, you know, in, in an industrial, you know, in a professional manner, because at university, I was that guy just going, what would happen if you, if you turned it up the other way? You know, and, and, and the lecturers would just look at me and be like, well, why would you do that? And it's like, to see what happened? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I think, absolutely. you know, within the industry, will you ever convince people to, you know, to turn it up the other way and see what happens? Probably not because their, you know, their wage and their salary depends on not pissing about. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, absolutely. Um, yeah. you know, in that kind of broader spectrum of of how these things operate, it's just, you know, I don't really blame 
these people in industry, um, you know, I don't blame them for seeing it the way that they see it, but I sure as hell think that they're wrong. You know, we're talking about the exact reasons why I switched out of, you know, bio, but, uh, biochemistry, you know, and not to pursue a master's of science, you know, because it, it's these exact reasons, you know, in my, in a first year course on scientific writing, um, it was the best course that I ever took in my whole university career. Fantastic professor. We learned everything about writing a paper, logical fallacies. We we learned it was a fantastic class. In the proposal, when we when we were discussing a proposal, you know, when you are proposing an experiment, you you must have a section on the expected results. That is generally understood to be a component of a good proposal. So you go to a supplement or pharmaceutical company, usually they are employing labs rather than somebody of goodwill is thinking, let's test out statins or something like that. Usually it's the other way around. But you know, if if I as a scientist were like, let's pursue this endeavor, I need to have, you know, the anticipated results. And you know, if I don't get those results, generally that's not going to get published because it's going to be we're going to look at it as a failure, you know, and, and we didn't learn about Karl Popper in, in university whatsoever. Not once. I don't think his name was mentioned to me. If, if a scientific experiment fails, isn't that some sort of falsification of the method? You know, isn't that what Popper was kind of getting at there? Like, you know, there's so much information that we can get in a failed experiment. There might even be more information that we can get from a failed experiment. What are your thoughts on that? I completely agree. Um, uh, you know, falsification is um, is to me science. You know, I, I think that um, uh, you know, I, I, I I've uh, done a Substack on on the control. What I believe to be is the most powerful part to um, the scientific method. Um, the part where you are a b testing it, it it is that applied science where you take you take uh you know um uh the independent var- variable you remove that from um from the experiment and you run the experiment and see if the observed effect happens um you know as as we're doing with the cell culture and i think um and 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 that is falsification and i think that um it's uh without doubt the you you also have a finite with the falsification which i think gives it a lot more um gravitas okay when you're seeking to prove something you can never be a hundred percent sure you know they they claim that you can't prove anything um <laughs> in science i've i've had this debate with a few people apparently yeah. you can't prove anything with science i don't know how forensic science is meant to work you know <laughs> as in there are plenty of people who have been proved guilty of something uh with science with forensic science unfortunately so there are there are finites you know um according to science um but you know when it comes to proving a theory you can be very sure, but is it definitely, definitely that? Or is it something on a much more macro scale or a much more micro scale that is also a variable to, to what's going on? You can never be 100% sure, which is where the idea that you, you can't prove anything. You know, you what happens within uh, forensic science and within law is, is that, you know, the proof is within, you know, the objective opinion of the judge or the jury, right? So that's where they're drawing a benchmark and going, we have to make a decision here. So that benchmark is in the legal system, in the judiciary, and there's 100% proof, we believe, or there's enough evidence to convict this man of murder, for instance. Mm-hmm. you know, based on blood spatter analysis or, um, uh, you know, for it, thumbprints, uh, you know, or, unfor- you know, unfor- unfortunately, my, my knowledge about, you know, uh, DNA evidence, uh, you know, is pretty, um, is pretty eye opening that I don't, I think that it's an area that really, really needs to be, but, 
really needs to be um, investigated. But you know, that's kind sure. of another story. You know, the you you can never have a kind of a full positive when you haven't got a benchmark that says you need to make a decision because even mm-hmm. when you're proving something you know in in the positive um there's always it always could be affected by something that is unknown or unseen or a parameter that you don't know whereas falsification is the other way around when you falsify something you are saying for definite it's not that so you have closure on it. You have you have a definite answer there within the experiment that you're doing. You know, just take um, you know a, any any kind of um, uh, any kind of uh, proposed experiment, and I and I go through these kind of experiments, and I can kind of tie this into the scientific method in general is is that you know a, a a very easy analogy for a scientific um experiment is you you propose that um uh ice creams cause sunburn okay um you so you, there's a very easy experiment to do. You 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 go down. You we see can like this one cause out. and effect that <laughs> ice cream sales are, are high, and also some sunburn is high at the same time. So what you do is you go down to a beach, yeah, in in the summer sun, and you make sure that ice cream there's no ice cream shops and no ice cream salesmen, and so you've removed the independent variable of the ice creams that you're saying causes the sunburn. This is a negative control. And lo and behold, people still get sunburned. So you have 100% falsified that ice creams cause sunburn because they happen when you rem- when you remove them. So you have a fi- you have a finite answer. And when we're talking about, you know, there's some contention about the experiments that we're doing. And I understand them on the philosophical level, as in, as a few things with the specifically with the cell culture isolation methodology, right? It is in vitro to start off with, and so here we have a problem: is is that in vitro is is manufactured, right? Mm-hmm. Um. It is not found in in nature. Um, I understand that. Also, when you're when you're looking at virus isolation, the virus has never been shown to exist in the first place, and so removing that away or saying that it's not there is is well. You can't, you can't do it, can you? And so people have suggested that the scientific experiment, the science is pseudoscience, and therefore you can't conduct an experiment to show that it doesn't work. Hmm. I, if you try and conduct an experiment, you're, you're not following the scientific method. And... I fundamentally disagree with that. I fundamentally disagree for a, for a few sure. reasons, and it kind of it kind of taps into what we're saying about falsification and about this benchmark. When the benchmark is there, when a decision has to be made in a law court, so the decision has to be made. Somebody has to rule, and therefore, somebody has ruled that there is enough evidence that is there that constitutes proof that somebody murdered somebody based on forensics evidence. And I think we're doing this the other way around with the cell culture experiment. So when you look at the isolation method, if you're to match it up with, um, with the scientific method, there is no, the very first step is observe a, a natural phenomenon, right? Well, in vitro isn't isn't natural. It's you you don't see it happening in the real world. So I understand the problem with that being that 
it's kind of not an experiment to start off with, right? You 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 are diverting away from um, the scientific method right from the start. But I would yeah. say a couple of things about that. That the experiment that we're doing um, is to falsify. It's a benchmark, just like the judiciary and judge in the forensics um, case for murder. It's a benchmark that says we don't have to believe that what we're doing is scientifically correct. We just have to make that benchmark to compare and contrast to prove further down the line that it's false. Um, and maybe I could kind of wrap the analogy into the description of, of what I would say and wrap that into um, the problems that some people have with uh, not being able to, you know, isolate the independent variable. If we go back to the analogy of ice cream sales and, and sunburn, okay, and you come up with something, a pseudoscience where the independent variable has never been proved to exist. So somebody hypothesizes that a unicorn uh, causes sunburn, okay? So we do the same experiment. We go down to the beach on a summer's day and it's sunny. We make sure there are no unicorns, yeah? We go, is there a unicorn around here? No? Great. We run the same experiment. You don't, you don't have to have proved that the unicorn exists. You also, you also, if you want to claim that there are unicorns on this beach, the burden of proof is to, to show that you haven't removed them in the negative variable, in the negative control. So lo and behold, there are no unicorns. People still get sunburn. And you have falsified the fact that unicorns cause sunburn. See, we've just conducted a, 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 a scientific experiment taking the benchmark, even though we've never observed a unicorn, we've never observed, you know, it's not a natural phenomenon. It's not a natural phenomenon according, according to, to, to theoretical science. We've still managed to conduct a, um, a scientific experiment that has falsified that unicorns cause sunburn. Okay, and this is what we're doing with the cell culture isolation process is, is that we started off with no possibility of a virus being in the culture according to having a PCR test and um, uh, 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 negative PCR test with all, all of the, we're using their parameters, you know, against mm -hmm. them as it were by saying they ha by their own standards it doesn't contain a virus and the negative control um <clears throat> in, you know what we're doing actually has nothing to do with viruses at all because the independent variable it very much exists it's the fetal bovine serum see yeah. uh, again a lot of people don't really understand the actual experiment that we're doing and to my mind, it follows the scientific method, which is we have an independent variable, which is fetal bovine serum concentration. And we have an observable effect that is cell death in the cell line. Um, mm -hmm. And so all of these things exist. We're not dealing with unicorns because we're not actually looking at that. We're just showing through scientific experimentation that the cell line breaks down and exhibits the morphological changes of uh, indicative within a cell line of viral presence within the same uh, time frame and to the same amount as recorded um, as being positive for a virus. So, you know, we don't, we, we have an existing independent variable that we knowingly remove i.e. we remove the concentration of, of fetal bovine serum. So the only part of the experiment that could be construed as not following the scientific method is um, observing a, a natural, naturally occurring phenomenon. Now, um, cell death within in vitro, it's not, it's not natural. 
But I would say, and this is kind of an area of um, contention, um, there's a fantastic interview, and I talked to him very closely. He's part of the project, a um, guy called Jordan Grant. Very, very good guy. Absolutely key on, on the fundamentals of science. And he gave an interview with, um, with Alex Zek, and he talks about, you know, you can keep going and keep going back through essentially what is philosophy of science until you kind of have to you have to draw a line to start off with and let me explain so within a naturally occurring phenomenon what is nature what is observe a naturally occurring phenomenon okay yeah. let me pose a couple of questions is a bird's nest a naturally occurring phenomenon okay because a bird is in nature okay the the twig that it gets it is in nature it has made a bird's nest most would say and i would probably agree that a bird's nest is a naturally occurring phenomenon but humans are also naturally occurring you know humans do take do cut pieces of people's tumors out of them and grow them in petri dishes that's made from plastic that's all of this is occurring in nature you know it's pedantic it's pedantic and you know i would be the first to say that in vitro studies are bullshit yeah, I don't think that you should use in vitro studies to indicate anything because it's just replicating something. And I think that, you know, applying, applying, uh, choosing to try and, and simulate applied science in vitro is a recipe for disaster. So I'll be the first to say that in vitro in and of itself is bullshit. The, you know, the, what, the experiment that we've conducted shouldn't be used for anything other than falsification. But when you are conducting these experiments that say you've got to start with a naturally occurring phenomenon, one naturally occurring phenomenon is objective as well. Observing is also objective. Your color green might look like my color pink. We don't know exactly what observe is, yeah? We, we, we're all different. It's all subjective. We don't know really what the, the benchmark of naturally occurring or even, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole area of um, uh, philosophy, which is um, uh, phenomenology, <laughs> you know, the random occurrences of things. And you keep going back, and this is what Jordan Grant was saying, you keep going back and you keep going back to the point where are we actually experiencing this are, or are we, you know, plugged into the matrix and, uh, you know, take the cord out the back and we're all, you know, jellyfish floating around everywhere else. You know, you can keep going back and keep going back and keep going back until it becomes essentially absurd. And so... Mm -hmm. This is where I stand on the scientific method being applied is, is that I think as long as you are um, falsifying things within these areas, being a kind of purist on the scientific method is not 100% necessary. Gotcha. Hmm. Wow. You know, and and I would like, I, I would there. say that about falsification. You know, no nobody uses it for falsification, and that's why. You know, when you talk about Sorry. scientific method, you, you you use it for proving things. It's always you know mm. this new drug, statins. You know, like you said earlier, this new drug cures this. You know, they 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 subvert that constantly, subvert the the scientific method. Um, yeah. for trying to prove things. And I think that just calling it a legitimate experiment um, in and of itself, because I think that you run the risk of saying, pointing at things and going, that's, that's also not science 
the cell culture sure. isolation control study that we've done is also not science because that also doesn't follow the scientific method. I think it's it's kind of a dangerous game to play when you are trying to seek purist science because, as I've explained, it could go all the way back to unplugging from the matrix and are we observing shit and, uh, you know, is this all real or a computer simulation? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. we would never get anything done. <laughs> we would we would just be sat there in in reams of what I would describe as sophistry. And I, I think you know you're kind of describing one of the critiques of the rationalist point of view, like for for a strict rationalism take, um, you know, a purely deductive logical means of exploring, you know nature or phenomenon in general you know their critique of empiricism is that if you are going to use the scientific method in a strict manner you'll get nowhere um because again like at some point you do need to sort of induce some sort of theory or story about it right and and you want to try and have some sort of external validity and i think that's an important question you look at the cell culture and you think okay what's the external validity of this can we apply even if you know your experiments you know showed that it's not the fetal bovine serum you know even though it obviously is but it like say it wasn't and it was caused by virus or a particle in the whatever i'm like this is all nonsense it's not true at all if that were the case what's the external validity of a petri dish to human beings because i had a really good conversation with a molecular biologist phd and he's very much on the opposing side of of our work here and he brought your name up a couple times actually um you know he said something and it made me think and i think i completely agree with him and i'll present what he said here um and i'll try not to butcher what he said too much but i do agree so um I brought up the old contagion experiments and I thought, you know, I think these experiments done like the Rosno experiments or the gonorrhea syphilis experiments in Guatemala. I was like, and and there's hundreds and hundreds of these occurrences, you know, with polio or whatever it is. I think I said, I think these studies are falsification of contagion. And his response was, it's a falsification of the methodology used. So I, I'm thinking, okay, if the methods used in the Rosnow studies was coughing and sneezing and breathing and, you know, putting mucus in other people's nose, if these are not plausible methods of transmission of illness, I, I agree. I agree. I think if the only way that we can create some sort of contagion is to introduce some sort of adjuvant or some sort of, you know, third party substance, I agree that that is a necessary component to create disease and symptoms in individuals and to create some sort of like idea of their idea of contagion, you know? So I think, I think that's really important. When it comes to the cell culture, we are not in the body and I get where you're coming at. And we talk about this a lot of what is, where do you draw the line of what is natural and then what becomes unnatural, right? Where do you draw that line? It's a very difficult line to draw. Um, But I think, you know, you know, with the falsification point of view, if we're falsifying methods, you know, the old contagion studies that are 100 years, the, the moderns will say they're outdated and we had a prevalent primitive understanding. If that method is falsified, so be it. I agree. I agree that that's been falsified. And these modern cell culture, you know, nonsense studies that are truly pseudoscientific if they work, then sure they work, but it doesn't really apply to real life, you know? And no, I I get exactly what you, what, what you're saying. And, and, um, I agree, you know, it's, it's just, uh, precise, um, precise verbiage, isn't it? That's, that's saying you falsified the method. Yeah. It just, you know, I think it's, you know, slight, slightly kind of attempting to, to, to twist the relevance out of it. Um, you know, by trying to imply that the methods were not natural, whereas, you know, in those Rosenau studies, they're as close as, damn it, you know, um, uh, 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 to natural natural methods. I mean, obviously, the most natural 
way of doing it is is just quarantine. Um, you know, it's just quarantining people, and, th- and there are a few of those contagion studies out there, more modern ones as well. You know, where they where they quarantine people. Um, you know, I, I I quite like a couple of the ones um, based in Arctic um, Arctic base. Um, there's uh, an an Antarctic um, uh, 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 station, and um, seventeen weeks after. Um, people were left you know in complete isolation um people develop colds and they you know it's 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 actually like one of the most complete contagion studies because people would do it so often there because it's cold (laughs) because during the winter there's like a cold snap that they had the um uh uh, there was a there was a cold unit in the UK who studied you know just how the common cold was transmitted for for I think it was about forty years before they packed up because they didn't they couldn't find out <laughs> you know they stopped funding it because they just didn't know and uh, they had the cold cold unit on guard waiting for when another one of these mysterious outbreaks of cold happened in completely quarantined conditions um, and. Not only did they um, they see a you know supposed outbreak seventeen weeks after being in complete isolation, they did they took samples and they put them in a cell culture, and um, that cell culture uh, 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 was it didn't exhibit CPE or did it did exhibit CPE? And then they tried to transmit it to animals and failed. Hmm. So it kind of contains everything. So they contracted this, you know, disease from nothing. And it was, it's not possible, you know, it, that it was a virus because it had been in 17 weeks. Um, mm-hmm. And even in, in this paper as well, they suggest because they map the, they said that it was a cold snap, right? They even make a suggestion that it's something to do with the weather, i.e. terrain. You know, so this one particular contagion study contains everything. It contains, you know, the reason why it might be occurring, the fact that it couldn't be a biological pathogen, the fact that the CPE, you know, happens regardless <laughs> of uh, whether, you know, um, these people, it's it's pathogenic or not, and they couldn't transmit it to other people. So it's kind of they've got rid of every single Cox postulate in one go. Mm-hmm. But then it gets it gets into this storytelling pissing contest once again, which we're kind of bringing it back to the the original like start of the conversation here. They would they I can hear the you know the modern scientist explain it out as oh well it must have been asymptomatic they must have <laughs> been a, a latent virus that took hold of them once their immune system was down due to the cold which aligns more with the terrain's idea than the germ theory again it seems like a falsification in their explanation but you know it, it, it again it gets into the storytelling of who can tell the more compelling story to convince the you know, the layman, right? And as I hate that word, but I mean, you know, yeah. it, it, it's applicable here, you know, because it's, it, it's rhetoric, it's rhetoric, it's a, it's a story. And it's obviously our preconceived understanding is that, you know, the germ theory is true and contagion of germs is real and viruses can cause disease. And, you know, so this is what's generally understood in the population, which brings me back to another point that I wanted to bring up. Which is why it is important that we show your your studies, why we do your studies. Because yeah. if the population, 99% of the population believes in unicorns, if we have to set up some sort of pseudoscientific study to prove that unicorns don't cause sun, like, sunburns, <laughs> yeah. it's a necessary part of the rhetoric to try and get the truth out, right? Because it's it's you know, we're fighting a very, very strong rhetoric and story that has, you know, a hundred years, 150 years of indoctrination behind it, you know, so it's very hard to break that spell. And and it is that and and it brings back the the other points that you were making earlier, the scientists aren't just going to flip flop back and say, Oh, you know, actually, 
my life's work has been a sham. You know, it takes a, a certain amount of humility um, you know, to admit something like that, to say, okay, well, what I've been doing has actually not been a true scientific experiment and the things that I believe in are were incorrect. That's a very difficult thing to do, especially when your livelihood rests on that, your, the yeah. respect within your field, you know, because you'll be instantly ostracized. You know, if you try to turn off, up the knob on a PCR, you're instantly ostracized. It, it's amazing. And that's yeah. why I got out of science. You know, when I was in lab, you know, once I started coming into this train theory, uh, to not theory, but this train paradigm, when I started asking my professors about, you know, PCR and why we're running it at 45 cycles and why the CT, like, well, you know, I'm like, why, why you're teaching us otherwise. And the labs are out here running really high PCR thresholds. I'm like, what, well, why are they doing this? And th they just instantly ostracized me, tried to embarrass me, came up with this story about why these papers are right and why it should be this way, or that I was some sort of, you know, conspiracy theory or something like that. And and that's really what pushed me out of the, you know, academia of organized academia. You know, yeah. I, I love science and I love the pursuit of knowledge and, you know, trying to understand our realm. That's what I'm here for. Um, you know, that's why I started this podcast and everything, but, you know, um, organized academia is a, is a whole, a whole other, whole other problem. But yeah. You touched upon a couple of things and it, it's, it's a much kind of wider philosophy, but, um, you know, I, I always try and steer clear of kind of, you know, what, what would be like, like you pointed out that, you know, there's a lot of inventive reasoning going on when it comes to this, you know, oh, there's a latent virus here or, you know, it's, it, it becomes absurd very quickly. I'm, I'm dealing with um, uh, a, uh, a, a breeding center in Colorado in the U.S. at the moment who are taking the state, who are suing the State Department because they um, put down a whole wealth of um, uh, puppies um, because they thought that they had um, rabies just based on on symptoms. And the thing about rabies is, I mean, it's awful. What they do to to animals is so much worse, you know, than humans. So the the um, you know the anti science and pseudo scientific areas of 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 what they're doing when it comes to viruses um, to do with animals. You know, obviously they torture all of the animals in clinical testing and everything. Um, but, you know, with, with dogs and rabies, for instance, they, there is no test that they can keep a dog alive. Yeah. And test for rabies, apparently, according to them, if, if it's suspected rabies, they have to euthanize the dog first to tell whether it has rabies or not. They have to kill it. And then they do this test and then they say, oh, it didn't have rabies. Or, oh, it did have rabies. Okay. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm helping um, this breeding center at the moment uh, take, um, and take the state to uh, sue the state um, based on malpractice. Um, you know, and when it comes to, you know, inventive reasoning is that, you know, they – come up with you know for instance you know rabies they say can be latent for up to 25 years you know so they're obviously explaining oh somebody got bitten by a dog but they seem fine and then 25 years later they develop liver issues ah that was that dog bite 25 years ago you know it's 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 storytelling and you touched upon it there that, you know, who can tell a better story? And I think that it's very, I would say that it's, it's much better in society just to falsify things rather than to try and say what it is. Because, you know, I, I often stay away from, you know, nutritional advice, for instance, you know, only eat meat, only eat veg, only eat fruit. Don't eat this fruit. Don't eat that meat. Don't eat this. I mean, obviously you can say, and this is where I stand is, is that don't eat processed shit food. 
you know, sh- made out of chemicals and sprayed with pesticides. Just, you know, that's pretty obvious. Stick to that. You know, but I think that you play a kind of dangerous game when you say everybody will be better off being a carnivore. Mm. Because I don't think that that's true. I think that, you know, everybody could benefit, but everybody's different, right? You don't know everybody's background. And so, you know, this is why it's very difficult to find out, you know, exactly how many people were injured or died from, you know, the vaccine. Because every single person is different, you know. Is it a combination of their nutrition, their stress levels, their drugs that they've taken, you know, um, their circumstances, situations, their environment they're in? You know, you it, there's an infinite, infinite amount of variables involved in that. And it's it's incredibly difficult to say this killed them unless unless, you know, the vaccine went in and 12 hours later they're dead. You know, you can pretty be certain that it played a large part in it. But apart from that, it's incredibly difficult to say exactly that it was one thing rather than a combination of things. You know, and and this is where we get at with, you know, terrain theory and, you know, what is the immune system? Ah, the immune system works through this. You have to have vitamin C, you know, ascorbic acid. Is it, you know, all of these things are predicated on, you know, a vitamin has never been isolated. You know, you go down all of these pathways that's like, yeah. is it actually in a lemon? Is is ascorbic acid actually in a lemon or is it just a biochemical, you know, it's a, bio, it's a biochemical fabrication. It, it, the vitamins have never been isolated. So, you know, even there, even within one of these stories, you know, um, you know, when, when you get into vitamin D and things like that, I mean, it's scary, you know, that it's, you know, they claim that it comes from the sun, um, you know, in pill format, here is a synthetic pill. And people don't, and I get into a lot of trouble with this, but people, cold, cold calciferol is rat poison. Yeah. That's yeah. what synthetic vitamin D is. Do not take it. Do, do not take it under any circumstance. Take these synthetic vitamins because who knows what they do. Yeah. But, you know, the problem is, is that I think the solutions are simple and, and, and within the terrain. And, and, and I think that you enjoyed this is, is that the terrain is an allegory for your immune system. That's all it is. You know, they come up with this inventive reasoning and the storytelling. And so they're kind of half right. Oh, your immune system is this, you get sick when you do this, but it's a very simple detox mechanism. Your body doesn't want something. And so it detoxes and that's it. It detoxes the things that it it doesn't want. Um, the things that it finds toxic or poisonous or has too much of already. And when you see the body and health in this very simplistic, almost conveyor belt type manner, it's, it's, you don't need to storytell anymore. You don't need to invent reasons why it's, why your body is doing what it's doing. I, I don't disagree with your approach that, you know, taking the, you know, applied science and experimentation, get your hands dirty, trial and error. I agree that that is what should be done. I do see an importance in the storytelling. I do because as humans, we love stories, you know, we love it. Whether it's, uh, whether it was a religious dogma or now a scientific dogma that, you know, took us over, whether or not it was the dogma of the chief in the tribe that you were in you know we we cling to these stories you know and so formulating a story the modern story of science that we are you know when we get sick we are deficient in pharmaceutical drugs or you know that if we have a low you know vitamin reading in our blood we need to take these synthetic vitamins you know these stories that were created i think it is a necessary 
to get people on a more natural way of life to tell a more true story. Yeah. Um, and, and I think people are longing for the story. I think people, I think people want the story. You see sort of this movement out of the allopathic, you know, modern way of doing things. Now you, you see a huge shift. And I, I do think that, you know, a strong rhetoric and a story is very important, you know, because the first thing anybody will ever ask you when you say, oh, well, germs don't cause disease. Well, what does? What does? Yeah. You know, that's the first thing that comes up, right? So the stories are important. And I think that's why like hearing about like f- for what convinced me, because I couldn't have been more on the allopathic side. You know, I was biochemistry all the way, you know, vaccines are safe and effective. And if YouTube's listening, they absolutely are, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but what convinced me was reading, you know, the invisible rainbow and seeing, hearing the story. And then, you know, the story was the beginning is the invisible rainbow or the moth in the iron lung. Are these, you know, empirical, is this empirical evidence of, you know, polio not, or polio not being caused by a virus or the flu not being caused by a virus? Of course they're not. They're stories. They, they tell, you know, a correlation, but it, it allowed, it allowed me to go and look for that evidence and to start doing those tests and to start putting my hand, you know, then I was like, Oh, well, like let's test out some of these antibody tests and you know what I mean? Let's, let's dig a little deeper and see what kind of literature is actually out there, you know? So it, it begun with the stories for me and then, you know, it moved into kind of getting my hands dirty. So I do agree that, you know, if you want to actually prove something, we got to get our hands dirty. We got to, you know, use our own, skills of observation and um but i think this having a strong rhetoric and a story surrounding this is, is a very important part of it i i, I think yeah i i completely agree and i i think that we could kind of um boil that into you know inventive reasoning i disagree with storytelling of inventive reasoning you know that that that's okay. where you know like you say you know um teaching people teaching people about the terrain and teaching people about that reality, I think is very different from attempting to reason um, inventively. Yeah. Because reasoning suggests that cause and effect is happening some way. You got bitten by a dog 25 years later, it could be rabies. If you're dead, if you were 70, you'd be dead anyway. You know, that, that is inventive reasoning. And I think that that's, they're trying to suggest that that's the way it works rather than uh, storytelling, like you say, which is, which is slightly different. It doesn't suggest that it does work that way. It suggests that you should try it yourself. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, this discussion, I, I don't want it to end. I really don't. I got to <laughs> run. So I want to ask for your final thoughts, anything you want to add to this episode. I think, of course, there's going to be another one moving forward because we could have taken this a hundred different ways, if not more. So any final thoughts on the episode? Um, I just wanted to um, say about, uh, I mean, I, I, don't know, I don't know how long we've got, but um, just get, it, get into, um, because uh, uh, there, was, there was some areas that were kind of, um, picked up uh before we talked we talked about um off camera that you wanted to ask about um carrie mullis and uh, a few other things that happened um uh with the dissidents movement um you know because that is a good story you know it's a good story of what of what happened and um i think a lot of people can kind of learn about you know because there are people that have been in my position, um, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, um, that did the same thing as me. You know, Eleni Papadopoulos Eliopoulos um, was a fantastic scientist. She was head of the Perth group. She was um, based at Perth University in Australia. And um, she conducted the original, um, you know, control experiments um, uh, by looking at papers 
by Bess and Galashnikov in 1977 and, and looking at the protein analysis of um, uh, uninfected to infected cultures and showed that the proteins were the same in uninfected cultures and as an infected. And uh, it ended with her book, um, her magnus opus, uh, A Virus Like No Other, um, where she pulled apart the entire um, HIV narrative that HIV exists and causes AIDS. And um, there was a faction between two kind of warring sections of scientists, uh, the Perth group uh, um, who were doing experimental science to show, um, you know, that the science behind AIDS and behind HIV was fraudulent. And there was a group of um, people that um, were coming up with all sorts of inventive reasoning that um, although they all agreed on on the dangers of drugs and and you know this is the allegory or what's happening in modern day modern times now is is that we all agree that vaccines are bad and aren't, aren't good for you but one section you know we're trying to get to the truth through experimental science to show that we don't need to have any more you know of these fake pandemics we can stop them and another another group um, that were involved with people like Carrie Mullis, um, people like Peter Duesberg, um, who came up with these kind of stories that were, um, it was inventive reasoning. You know, uh, Carrie Mullis is a big one that a lot of truth uh, movement, people looking to get to the truth because he did, died in mysterious circumstances, you know, in 2019, right before 2020, they seem to think of him as some kind of hero. And it's very odd. It's very odd that I can tell you beyond no shadow of a doubt that if Carrie Mullis were alive, and I don't really like to, you know, speak about, speak ill of the dead, but, you know, before I even knew who he was, he was dead. Um, if he were alive, he would be thought of as no different to Christian Drosden or even an Anthony Fauci. His supposed, you know, um, methodology enabled the scandemic. He, ena he enabled 2020 to happen. He is an establishment. He's an actor. He's an establishment actor. Um, he, people don't actually know that he didn't actually invent the PCR at all. It was Frederick Sanger, yeah, in the kind of late um, the late seventies. Yeah. He was developing that thing. The only thing that that Karen Mullis is attributed to is developing whilst on an acid trip, wearing a Hawaiian shirt. I mean, the whole thing is theatre. You know, it, it, he just he had this persona that he was this. It, you know, it's a completely concocted story. He's this, you know, wild child. He's he's totally against the system and totally, um, uh, you know, way out wacky. He wears these open sh Hawaiian shirts and, you know, he's the bad boy of science and he takes acid and he, he came up with TAC polymerase, which is an enzyme used within PCR. That's what he's actually attributed to, to developing. That's what he got the Nobel Prize for, yeah, uh, which is from a hot spring. It's an enzyme from a hot spring called TAC polymerase, an enzyme that they put in. It's complete bollocks. It's complete and utter bollocks. And um, without him, without his story, the the scandemic would have never happened. So putting this guy on a pedestal is bizarre because he was a fraud. Not only that, it's a lot worse than that. And I want to kind of introduce um, uh, some good friends of mine that are the, the, the – um, uh, surviving members of the Perth group who lived through this, who knew um, a confidence of um, Eleni Papadopoulos Eliopoulos, and who worked closely with Carrie Mullis on some of the video productions uh, that he was in. And he then went on, there was a case uh, of a guy called Perenzi, um, Andre Chad Perenzi, who got ended up being convicted of giving somebody HIV. Now, 
the Perth group were trying to stand to defend based on a no virus claim to defend him. And Carrie Mullis was actually brought into this case as a as an independent expert and said that his PCR machine was valid technology and may be used to convict this man, which he did. He got an innocent man convicted of, and I don't know exactly how long, but of a very long time in prison because basically Carrie Mullis said, yep, you can take my machine and show that he has HIV and gave it to um, a few of these sexual partners that he was accused of intentionally making making sick with HIV. And all of the emails are publicly available where he says, you can use my machine. Uh, it, it, it is what it says it is. The, the, the results are what they say they are. And he got the man convicted. Um, and so, you know, holding, holding, um, people like this on a pedestal and saying that these people just purely because of some anecdote about it not being able to be used to detect, you know, disease, um, that's written on the back of the boxes. It's written on the back of the primers. It tells you that, you know, you don't need Carrie Mullis to tell you that it, you know, it's, it's, it's right there in black and white, but I think that it's important to, um, learn from these stories about who is actually and i i i don't like sides because i think as as soon as you draw like a delineation of is somebody on this side or that side you're immediately partitioning but carrie mullis was certainly not interested in the truth you know because wow. when it comes to the pcr the actual truth is what exactly are they measuring you know, that's the question that needs to be asked, yeah. not how many cycles or what, what, you know, what is the threshold or baseline threshold or anything to do with the garbage that's in it. It's, is it actually when you're putting a fluorescent dye in, you know, binding to what they're saying it is, that's, that's really the questions that need to be asked. And that's really where, you know, you need to, um, investigate rather than looking at the people or looking at the drama or looking at the theater and the Hawaiian shirts and the acid taking and the, you know, the concocted stories. Um, and, and, wow. and, and really, you know, this is where it gets to is, is that there were scientists doing that. You know, there were scientists such as Eleni Papadopoulos, Eliopoulos, Val Turner, who were, scratching away at that surface and unfortunately you know um their message and their story um was never put on a pedestal like carrie mullis's and yeah. it's thanks to people like you um liev that you're doing that great work now and thank you so much you know for having me on and letting me tell the story of this experimental science and you know amplifying that message and amplifying that story to take it to people and i think it's important I appreciate that. And I appreciate your time and all the valuable insight. And I look forward to our next discussion. Uh, we're going to put all your links down below Twitter or X Substack. I think those are the, the two main ways. Am I missing yeah, any? Yeah, that's, it. that's it right on. I can't wait to hear more about this. I think we're gonna have some, some good episodes moving forward. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So again, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you, mate. I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, you should all know this is not medical advice or scientific advice. Uh, Jamie and I both believe that vaccines are safe and effective, and all this is just for informational purposes only. But also remember, we are all responsible sovereign beings capable of thinking, criticizing, and understanding absolutely anything. We, the people in the greater forest, are together self-healers, self-governable, self-teachers, and so much more. You know, So please reach out if you have any questions, criticisms, comments, concerns, whatever it is. If you like this, if you appreciate it, if you... Found it informative. Give us a like, share, comment, subscribe. Do what you got to do to help the channel grow. It's much appreciated if you could do that. Uh, sharing is always the best way to do so, though. So share to a friend, family member, stranger, whatever it's got to be. All right, guys. Really appreciate you all for taking the time today. Remember, there are two types of people in this world. Those believe they can. Those believe they can't. And they're both correct. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Take care.